Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, good afternoon. I would like to begin by thanking Dr. Ahmed Shahi, Dr. Bona Malwal, and Dr. John Abel of Christian Solidarity International in Switzerland for their excellent job in organizing this important conference. In my remarks, I would like to share some thoughts on the crisis of pluralism in the Middle East. I will do so by surveying negative, the negative trends in the Middle East region, the status of Arab Christians, and possible solutions of togetherness that could help move the Middle East away from its crisis of pluralism towards a more democratic and uh, hopeful future. As I will emphasize a stable future, both for religious minorities and for all the people of the Middle East, can only be secured through a culture of democracy. A culture of democracy that values pluralism and acceptance of others, including those of different religious tradition. Therefore, some themes I hope we examine during these procedures are human rights, freedom, democracy, and good governance. In the Middle East, Christians and other religious communities are often victims of persecution perpetrated by state and society. Yet we must also acknowledge this, this fact. If Christians are among the first targets they are not the only targets. With the Middle East environment that will, that still features a notable lack of freedom and democracy, extremist Muslims often harass and oppress moderate Muslims. <coughs> and that, what Reverend Williams, the small, the, uh, the, in the beginning, uh, uh, focused on also this phenomenon that not only the Christians are victims, but also there is a kind of uh, persecution within the various communities and the religions in the area. Therefore, I assert, let us focus not our attention, not only on enhancing minority rights in the Middle East. Instead, let us explore ways and means of achieving democracy and good governance in the Arab world, a condition that would bestow the benefits of human rights and freedom on all communities in the region. What are the major negative trends in the Arab world? Before noting certain negative regional trends, I should first express my perspective on the Arab awakening the collective name given to the socio-political changes that have swept across the Middle East in recent years. Simply put, the Arab awakening is one of the great hope-inspiring developments of early 21st century history. Thanks to, the, to his million of people, to this million of people, now live under governments and within societies that are far more responsive to their hopes and aspirations. In my estimation, the Arab awakening has featured two aspects. In its first aspect, the Arab awakening is a struggle between all dictatorial governments and the forces of change. We have witnessed the struggle between dictatorship and change play, and change play out in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Libya, and most destructively in Syria. In its second aspect, the Arab awakening became a clash between the forces of freedom and democracy, led by a useful vanguard, and religious extremists bent on imposing a perversion of divine doctrine. We have seen the second aspect of the Arab awakening manifested in countries such as Egypt and Tunisia. In Egypt, during the initial phase of the anti-Mubarak protest, a group of young Egyptian revolutionaries called for democracy and pluralism under the slogan, the cross and Quran together. In a subsequent phase of the Egyptian revolution, however, the Muslim Brotherhood 
and other Islamists sought to dominate the scene by employing the rhetoric of Islamic solidarity. This was a blatant attempt to push Egyptian Christians to the sidelines. During a third phase of the Egyptian revolution, a kind of antidote to the Muslim Brotherhood arose in the form of pro-democracy agitation that again emphasized the solidarity of all Egyptians, no matter their religion. Overall, the spread, the spread and intensification of religious extremists in the Arab world poses a threat to religious minorities, no less than it does to the forces of Arab democracy. For this reason, these two groups, which often overlap in any case, should work in tandem to overcome the crisis of pluralism that could permanently damage both. Across the Arab world, dangerous signs of a region-wide spiral of conflict are apparent. Christian communities in Syria, for example, have been subjected to violent attacks perpetrated by religious extremists. Here, I would like to highlight the disturbing case of the simultaneous abduction in April of the Greek Orthodox Archbishop Boulos Yaji, <coughs> along with the Syrian Orthodox Archbishop Yohanna Ibrahim. They were traveling by car to Aleppo, Syria, when unknown gunmen intercepted them, killed their driver, and took both hostage. Early this month, I received assurances from the acting president of the Syrian National Council, George Sabra, that the two archbishops were in good health and in custody of the Syrian rebel group. Yet, this information offers little comfort to Christians in Syria or the, re the regions we want to know. And why? They want to know why these respected figures were taken prisoner and what the dangerous incident means for the future of Christians in Syria and in the Middle East. In short, the dual kidnapping sends an extremely dangerous message that certain influential elements do not want Christians in post-Assad Syria. There can be little doubt that the disappearance of these Christian leaders were meant as a prelude to attacks on Christian churches and assaults on Christian families. <coughs> All part of a campaign to uproot a community whose presence in Syria long predates the arrival of Islam. Beyond intensified persecution at the hands of local actors, Arab Christians have, re have reason to fear larger international trends, including the wait-and-see attitude that many influential countries, including the United States, have adopted. Ladies and gentlemen, in bringing us together, our distinguished, distinguished co-conveners made reference to, and I quote, the existential crisis facing the religious minorities in the Middle East. I would now like to share some thoughts for an Arab Christian perspective on the nature and dimensions of this existential crisis. According to estimates, at the beginning of the 20th century, Christians constituted approximately 20% of the total population of the Middle East. Today, that figure has dwindled to just 5%. Projecting population trends forward, the Middle East remaining 12 million Christians may be reduced by 50% in less than a decade. <coughs> the scream statistics demonstrate beyond doubt that the region is facing a crisis of pluralism and Arab Christians are perhaps its primary victims. The word perhaps maybe is not uh, accurate. The Arab Christians are its primary victims. Over the last decade or so, the course of Middle East history has not been kind 
to the region's Christians. To Iraqi war, the Iraq, the Iraq war, the Syrian war, the continuing cycle of Palestinian Israeli violence, and the political upheaval associated with the Arab awakening. All of that have uprooted many Arab Christians, causing them to flee abroad, often to countries outside the Middle East. In some cases, Christians have been targeted in systematic killing campaigns. Such can only be categorized as ethnic cleansing, as my dear friend Dr. Ebner mentioned this morning. Such campaigns have included the murder of priests and attacks on churches and other religious centers. Just such a pattern of persecution, for example, has forced more or more or less two thirds of Iraq's Christians to flee. Is the figures? Even when Arab Christians remain in their country of origin, they often face an array of challenges, including government discrimination, informal social prejudice, and a litany of constrictive religious laws and practices. Operating in an environment in which their own governments either ignore or obstruct their interest, Arab Christian communities urgently need support from an array of governmental, intergovernmental, and non-governmental organizations. Given the undeniable facts of the crisis of Christianity in the Middle East, it's a disturbing fact that little attention has been devoted to this issue by governments, international organizations, even the traditional and the new media. The prominent American journalist Jeffrey Goldberg recently told a colleague writing a history about this topic that the persecution of Arab Christians is, and I quote, one of the most undercover stories in international news. The fact, I don't know why. The conspiracy of silence, maybe. Possible solutions. As members of this distinguished audience know, the time is overdue to formulate and implement solutions to the crisis of pluralism in the Middle East. This project must be pursued urgently before the prospects for democracy fade and the very category of Arab Christians all but disappears. If Christianity disappears from the Arab world, if Christianity disappears from the Arab world, then this will be a tremendous negative blow to the Middle East as a region and to its dominant religious community, Muslims, to be a prejudice for the region and for the Muslims themselves. Without a doubt, Arab Christianity adds a vital element of positive richness to all aspects of life in the region. I began my remarks by noting how a better future for all the people of the Middle East depends on a culture of freedom and democracy that respect pluralism, that respect pluralism. We can start with two dimensions involving reform of the mind and the articulations, articulation, the articulation of ideas, namely education and the media. The first step to achieving Arab democracy and ensuring pluralism is to give the region's youth tangible proof that their lives are improving by any means. Here we must remember that the Arab awakening was at heart a movement by the young in favor of change and against a present filled with despair. To inspire, to inspire Arab youth to support universal values of freedom, democracy, and pluralism, access to primary and higher education must be enhanced. Above all, new curricula 
at all educational levels must emphasize the teaching of tolerance, togetherness, and partnership. Beyond educational reform, a new Arab media must become a partner in creating Arab democracies. The new media should promote hope and the ideals, principles, and procedures of, plural, of pluralism. Therefore, international agencies affiliated with the United, the United Nations, as well as private sector NGOs, should help train media not only in technical areas, but also in the norms and standards of democracy and diversity. In terms of accountable government, to consolidate the Arab awakening, the, the countries need to create those classic institutions that place the frame of democracy, namely parliaments, executives, and courts with independent identities and constitutionally expressed powers. Those reforms are essential to spread the real democracy and freedom in the area. A condition, as the Reverend expressed this morning, democracy is essential to preserve the dignity, the dignity of the, the people. The project of reforming of Arab governments is, of course, primarily an Arab responsibility. Yet the international community can and must assist in this process. A new coalition composed of official and non-governmental representatives from the established democracies could be created to help the emerging democracies of the Arab world. Such a pro-democracy coalition could assist Arab governments and Arab public in critical areas, like democracy training at all levels of society, of society. This proposed coalition for Arab democracy must also be prepared to issue strong warnings to Arab governments if they deviate from the norms of human rights and democracy. We're mentioning the attitude of the, the United States, for instance, and some other countries. And uh, this uh, attitude is very pervasive and uh, very dangerous for the future of democracy in the area. This silence is um, against, against the uh, improvement of democracy and freedom in the region. In certain severe cases, failure to uphold democratic governments should result in tangible negative consequences, such as a reduction in foreign assistance and even broader political and economic sanctions. Of course, no reform of Arab societies, whether in education, the media, or government, will succeed if Arab majorities do not support such measures, if democracy and its essential feature, pluralism, are to succeed, then Arab Muslims must never view Arab Christians as intruders to be expelled. The challenge for Muslim Arabs at this critical moment is to demonstrate that the Middle East, a region where Muslims predominate, is capable of achieving pluralism, freedom, and modernity. Now is the time for the troubled region to transcend sectarianism and define a concept of citizenship based on universal values of tolerance and democracy. As history demonstrates, pluralism benefits not only minorities, but all sectors of society. In this context, context we may ask how can moderate Islam prevail for the benefit of all Muslims and the wider world if Middle East Christianity disappears? As a fit response, Muslim of goodwill can help preserve and enhance the moderate core of Islam by forging partnerships with their Christians, com Christian compatriots. If 
Arab Muslims create partnership with Arab Christian to forge democracy in the Middle East, then this will send a strong message to the world that the Muslim community is at its center, moderate, and committed to pluralism and liberty. For their part, Christians should at all times emphasize that they are loyal citizens of their respective countries. In this way, they will exercise the rights and the responsibilities of civic life and help guide their societies into a new 21st century pluralism. Arab Christians everywhere can find inspiration from the record of Lebanese Christians, who in accord with their best traditions have made decisive contributions to the cause of democracy and pluralism by championing civic, civic law, by tolerating different political views, celebrating personal liberty, upholding the independence of civil society, maintaining ties with other Christian communities in the Middle East, and remaining attuned to global trends and influences. What about Syria? At this historic moment, the issue that threatens the stability and therefore the future of the entire Middle East region is the Syrian crisis. What is now an internal civil and sectarian war can easily become a regional war, pitting states and religious religions against each other in a guerre outrance. The joint kidnapping of the Syrian archbishops I mentioned a moment ago is a fourth state of what we can expect amid such a war. Given the urgency of terminating the war in Syria, full support must be given to the diplomatic, diplomatic initiative co-sponsored by the United, United States and Russia. Should the Geneva Two Peace process succeed, it will bring relief not only to Syria, but to communities throughout the Middle East, including Christians. Beyond crisis management and war termination, the international community, including religious communities, need to think how to bring about a Middle East region defined by peaceful coexistence, democratic principles, and economic opportunity. In this regard, I have proposed a new Marshall Plan for Arab democracy, one supported by the established democracies of the Atlantic community and dedicated to forging partnerships with and among the emerging community of Arab Democrats. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, to conclude, I have no doubt that leading representatives of the Arab Muslim majority are ready and even eager to participate in a great project focusing on interfaith dialogue and democracy building which in the Middle East must go hand in hand. At this time, we need an interface dialogue initiative to build on the great symbolism that was achieved in late 2007, when King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia met with Pope Benedict at the Vatican. More recently, an important pro-democracy statement was issued in June 2011 by Grand Imam Ahmed al Tayyib, Sheikh of the prestigious Al Azhar in Cairo, the world's leading center of Sunni Muslim thought. In the twin projects of interface dialogue and democracy building in the Arab world, the full participation of Christians is vital. Allow me to finish with the following reflection by the journalist John Allen, which appealed four years ago in the New York Times, and I quote. Historically, Arab Christians have promoted a pluralistic vision of society, standing between resurgent Islamic fundamentalism and ultra-nationalist strains in Judaism. If they disappear, if the Christians disappear, prospects for peace become dimmer. End of quote. In conclusion, I urge all of us present here today to take the facts and analysis we have heard in the course of these proceedings 
and built on them in concrete ways. Most urgently, let us consider what kind of interface and civil society forums we can build that will help focus the world's attention on managing and then resolving the crisis of pluralism in the Middle East. Thank you.